We are so happy to have you with us this afternoon. Welcome to another webinar brought to you by Choose Life International. My name is Kanja Wilhelm Earthlight, and I will be your host for this afternoon as the Thomases are often super, super important business, but know that they are here with us in the spirit. So, webinar 198. <clears throat> Do you imagine we are up to 198 webinars? I'm so excited. And we have such a fun-packed evening for you today. We will be speaking with the Tyson family and boy, they have quite a story, man. Where I'm, I know you won't be able to, to believe what you are going to hear today, but only because of the grace of God, they have made it this far and they're able to share with us. So before we get started, let us have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your goodness towards each and every person here and those who are listening online and those who will listen in the future. We thank you for the many blessings and your, your mercy and grace towards us. And we ask you, Father, to just give an air, give an eye over this webinar this evening. Allow us to have an excellent webinar and let those who hear it say that they were good to, they were, they, felt good to hear and to participate in what we have to share this evening. We thank you for everything, Father. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So for those of you who don't know, but if you're one of our regulars, I'm sure that you know all about Truth Life International. Choose Life International is a faith-based organization that was established in June of 2008. And we are in the business of helping people live spiritually, emotionally, and physically. We are a grief counseling center and we are in the business of suicide prevention amongst other things. And so when we were hit with COVID-19 two years ago, we decided to start doing these webinars as a way to help people cope with what they were going through. And two years later, thanks to our audience, people like you keep, who keep coming out every single week, we have made it to 198 webinars. Our title for this afternoon is Grace and Mercy in Family Crisis. And I, as I have said to you before, we have the Tyson family with us, but I will leave it to our wonderful moderator for the afternoon to tell you a little bit more about the family. But let me start by telling you about the moderator, our moderator for this evening. Welcome to this wonderful woman. Her name is none other than Alison Solomon Nicholson. She has been a Christian for over 40 years and met Jesus while she was attending the University of the West Indies. It was during her studies there that she had the opportunity to meet a lovely couple that we will be speaking with this afternoon. That relationship has been very special and has blossomed over the years and of course continues to this day. Alison is a medical doctor and married to Michael Nicholson. The couple have three children and two grandchildren. So without further ado, Alison, over to you. Thank you so much for that introduction, Karjel. It is really a privilege and an honor to be here with you sharing in this interview. I'm so happy to be interviewing my friends, my best friends, Raul and Esther Tyson, as well as their, their family. Um, it's also good to touch base with Michaela, who is away. And of course, Sarah and Michaela and Jonathan, both away, one in the US and one in Canada and Sarah here with us in Jamaica. So I'm sure most persons are familiar with the Tyson family. Um, they're very well known, certainly throughout Jamaica and other parts of the world. But just for the few persons who might not know about you, um, Pastor Royal and Mrs. Tyson. Um, pastor Royal Tyson, he's a full-time pastor and he's one of a team of pastors at the Christian Life Fellowship. And we are located in Kingston, Jamaica. His wife, Esther, 
um, is former principal of Arden High School. Um, when she went, it was Arden High School. And after she left, it was the Arden High School. Right, um, Esther? Right. Um, they have three children, as I mentioned before, and they are here with us. So we will hear more from them as we go along. So it's my privilege to invite the audience to join us in the Roll and Esther Tyson story of grace and mercy in family crisis. If ever there was a story that um, demonstrated this, this certainly is one. And I'm sure when you think you've heard enough and when you've heard more than any one person can take, you're going to be hearing more and more. But coming under all of that is the amazing grace that God has poured out on this family to enable them to be here in front of you, smiling today, and their children prospering and um, doing well. Amen. So Esther, we give God thanks for that. Can't take it for granted. I want to start from the very beginning, Esther, and I want to ask you to give your viewers a background of um, how you and Raul came together, what was happening. Just, just take them in a quick walkthrough. I know that you'll want to linger on memory lane, but we have so many things. <laughs> to just give them a quick walkthrough. On All right. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I was, a stu I was finishing my third year, final year uh, on UWE, at UWE. And Raul was in his first year at UWE. And uh, we connected because we had a retreat that I was helping with because I'd already graduated and he was there. And I had an issue, uh, a decision to make about whether or not I should join Sunshine Singers at that time. Those of you who are older would know that group, David Keene and the Sunshine Singers. So I went and spoke to Raul because was, he was the leader of the... Uh, student Christian group on campus. So I went to speak to him to get his advice along with Jean Denham, for those of you who know. So that's the first time we had a conversation. And I took the decision to become a member, a part of the Sunshine Singers, and therefore remained in Kingston instead of going to St. Anne, where I had a job li lined up for me at St. Hilda's High School. So that's how we met. Okay, so uh, was it love at first sight? Your viewers are want to hear that. No, not I, I don't know about Raul, but I mean, eventually, um, you know, we sensed, each of us sensed that, that the Lord was leading us into this relationship. Um, for me, it was a little problematic because Raul is two years younger than I, and as far as I'm concerned, I'm to marry somebody who was five years older. So that really was a huge block. Was the five years chosen just because your father was five years older? Oh, yes, than your daddy was five years older than mama, so therefore that's a pattern. Yes. Oh dear. Who are you able to discuss those concerns with at that at that stage? You want to talk to an older person. Um, yeah. How did you navigate those challenges? Uh, well, we at that point in my life, I was involved with um, Deeper Life Ministries, the charismatic movement in Jamaica. So one of the persons I spoke with was Peter Morgan at that time, um, in terms of both of us, when we sensed that this we, we needed to go in this relationship. Rawls spoke to men that he related to, and I spoke to Peter. I had Denver Keene, who was my friend, and all of this. Everybody wondered what we were waiting so long for, you know, that type of thing. <laughs> so um, can you just give us a little bit about how this was formalized? Did you approach Raul? Did Raul approach you? No, 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 no. I was not going to approach no man. Just Seriously. Yeah. So anyway, so Raul took me out to lunch. And you see, he was had a reputation of saying that he's going to be like the Apostle Paul. So he never had Amen. a girlfriend. I was his first girlfriend. And so, therefore, he told me he was taking me out to lunch after we went to prayer breakfast. And then he took me out to lunch and took me to meet his mother. I never thought anything special about going to meet his mother. I thought it was a nice idea. So when we were um, coming back, he told me, you know, that he's in love with me. And I told him I'll have to pray about it. And then he backtracked and said it was a joke. And I was not happy about that at <laughs> all. You know, so we, we <laughs> I went to my parents for Christmas and came back and we had a discussion about it and realized from talking with each other about what we were sensing in the Lord, that this was what the Lord wanted. I was having dreams about it. He was having all sorts of things, visions and stuff. And so we prayed about it and with confirmation from friends that we really appreciate and respected, we started this relationship. Great. 
Good. Now, um, there was something with a letter um, in the early stages. Tell me a little bit more about the letter because this sets the tone of how certain you guys were about the relationship to some extent. Well, the letter, because I was upset about the fact that he could trifle with my emotions by telling me it's a joke after he declared his love for me. I wrote a letter and said, now imagine if I was a flighty girl and you sent something like that and then backtrack how it would have destroyed a flighty girl. And thank God I'm not a flighty girl, you know. So therefore, at that time, we discussed that and we really prayed together about it and we came to that decision to start this relationship okay and i do remember um you're telling me about certain sentiments that were expressed in his letter concerning a diamond to be um... oh, well, oh that was a note so therefore after we decided to start this relationship deeper life ministries had a new year's uh ball or not ball banquet and he was taking me to this banquet and when we were going, I said to him really that for me, I have to deal with hurts from past relationship. So I'm not into this goo goo gaga type of thing. And it was the, through the love that he has for me that will heal those hurts. So then he pulled out this note and showed me almost word for word what the Lord had told him, which was what I was saying to him at the same time. So things like that happened with us at the beginning of our relationship, just to confirm that it was a God thing. It was not just the two of us just being attracted to each other. Wonderful. And you also had confirmation from some of your elders, elder, older persons in deeper life. There was one right. person in particular, a pastor, who you would speak to from time to time. Yes. Um, I think that was, that was um, Peter Morgan. And, and he just really, it's almost like he knew, so he was smiling and wondering uh -huh. why we were taking so long to get things started. So you basically had the support of a community behind you before you ventured out into marriage. Would that be fair to say? Would it be fair to say that, Esther? Say what? That you had the support of a community behind you both. Yes. Before you yes, ventured definitely. out into marriage. Right. Because Raul was a leader of what was we call covenant group or house group then. And um, he had young men, not well, they, they weren't younger than him, much younger, but that he was mentoring, discipling. And he had told them that he was going to be like the Apostle Paul. And they were very distressed. They said they were about to walk away from him because they never got that revelation. <laughs> and then, so therefore, they were very happy when he came and told him about Esther, because, you know, they were, they prefer that tune. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. So I know you had a whirlwind romance with the blessing of the Lord and an entire community behind you. The world was your oyster. Um, when did you get married exactly? Can you remember? And tell us a little bit about the involvement of the community that you are a part of in your actual wedding plans. Okay, so I was full time with Sunshine Singers. I, I had no salary. Um, all that was paid was from my rent was paid. And I had two or three of my sisters living with me and I had to support them. So it was a walk of faith. And during that time, persons who knew I was full time, they would give me support now and again. And the, our house group would also um, give me support. And, and that, that was how we managed but when we were getting married, we had no money. No, I had a sense in my spirit that we were going to get married on the 29th of December. Raul was still a student. Raul was a student uh, when we got married. He would graduate the following year, June. And he said that we cannot get married on the 29th because he has a married biology field trip. So I said nothing, but I knew in my heart what I heard. And so he was proposing the 15th of December. So I went along with it. And then he came back and said, they changed the date of the trip. And so the 29th was available. So we, as we, I said, we had no money. Raw was a student. I had just started um, teaching at Arden High School the August and then um, this was December. So really, I hadn't worked much money. I had my sisters to look after. And so we, we just started in, we, I just knew in faith this was the time. Now, my dear sister Carol 
was going to Canada for the first time, and I had a vision in my mind of how my bridesmaids should look, and Alison was the maid of uh, uh, matron of honor, all of you. So now I said they are to wear the colors of the sunset. So it, it should be uh, yellow, and it should be burnt orange, and all of this. And Alison was to wear a, a, a color that combined, a material that combined all of these colors. And my, my, my uh, whatever you call it. Anyway, I had no money to give Carol. I just tell her I, I need this. And long and short of it, all sort of looking, she came back with the exact material that I needed. Now, you young people need to understand that those were the days of austerity when you couldn't get nothing in Jamaica, right? And for the food, my, 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 there was a friend from St. Elizabeth who drove up to us with a car bag full of all sorts of grown provisions to, for the wedding that I did not pay for. There was a friend of my father, God bless his soul, didn't have much, so he gave us a goat. My brother gave us a suckling. And then we needed to get the chicken. And this brings in Cobb, that's Alison's husband. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Cobb, they, are, they were just married a year before us. And Cobb went and cleared out the $200 out of his bank account and gave us to buy the chicken. So that's how we got our meat kind. Everything persons gave us, we didn't ask, they just gave. And the, there's a, a caterer that belonged to Deeper Life. And we asked her, would she cater to us? We did this in faith. We expected that the Lord would provide the money to pay her. And she agreed. And then she came back and said, the Lord says she is not to charge us. No, not only did she not charge us, she provided servers for the event. Okay? So our honeymoon was given to us as a <laughs> gift. We had no money. And we got married of 300 people. No debt everything covered and paid for the lord provided for us every need that we had amen that's a wonderful testimony esther and esther and Raul, and it would give you the sense of almost like a stamp of approval god you know stamping this union with his own approval providing and opening doors for you as somebody saying in the chat an amazing faith journey so far god is in control amen. so esther i want you to tell us about the first major crisis to hit your family, to hit, well, you're just a couple and no, you no, you had children. Tell us about the yes, first the major crisis. Sorry course. about that. Yeah. Right. Two years, so, I believe. Huh? How many years after you were married that did this first? No, that in that, that was in, we got married in 1979 and Raul was shot in 1997. Mm -hmm. So it was quite a way. We had all three children. Um, Sarah was 10 years old, Jonathan was 12, and Michaela was 15. Michaela was in high school preparing to do CXC. Jonathan was in second form, eighth grade at Arden High School. And Sarah, you were still in prep school, I think. Yes, because she was 10. So, Raul uh, has a, had a fish farm. He, he was involved in marine biology. Um, he worked with Jamaica Broilers to develop their fish farm in St. Elizabeth. <clears throat> we lived there for four years. Um, Jonathan was born there. I got pregnant with Sarah there. Michaela moved there when she was one year old. And so we were there for four years. And then Raul developed this passion for the fish farming and wanted to have his own fish farm. So eventually, he, the Lord worked it out. That's another story. And he got this fish farm. And he, we moved back, first of all, we moved to Mandeville for a year, then we moved to Kingston. And he got involved again with church because he was involved in the leadership of church before we went to St. Elizabeth. And when we came back, he got involved with church and also running his fish farm. So at, on the fish farm, for those of you who don't understand that, it is in St. Catherine. And he had 80 acres of ponds and he would grow tilapia or freshwater fish. And they, um, they would sell the fish on the pond banks to the higglers who would come and buy the fish and then take them to the fish market to be sold. So it was December and Raul wanted to give the workers a bonus. In, in Jamaica, that's very important, you know, 
that you give your workers a bonus. And he decided to do a car sale. He had stopped doing that because they had been held up before. And he had worked out something for them to go to the bank and pay and bring a voucher. But he wanted the cash to pay his workers. And so they decided to do a cash sale. And when, they were, when, that was, was, when it started, then gunmen came on the farm. They attacked um, him, shot him. His, his farm manager pulled his gun to try to help Rawl, and they killed him. And so Rawl was left for dead. And um, his work, one of his workers, who did not have a, a, a license, put him in, a, in the, the farm van and drove him to Spanish Town Hospital, which was like about yes. 10 miles away. Yes. So that was the, that was the first incident. So as we, as we listen to this crisis that's evolving, um, God's grace was manifested in several ways Amen. from the very beginning. You want to tell, take us through that, Esther? Yes. Um, first of all, I was at the market, Coronation Market, with my friend Abbott, who is now deceased. Uh, we were preparing for Christmas dinner. Our families ate together with my sister Carol, Abbott, and my family. So we were there. And then I saw my sister Carol coming down Tuesday morning. She used to be at work. And I'm like, what is she doing here? And she's not in her work clothes. And she said to me, I said, what happened to daddy? And she said, it's not daddy. Rawl has been shot. And I just started one balling in the market. And the people gathering around want to know what happened. Now, Pastor Bruce had driven um, Carol down to the market. So they organized a car would drive my car and let us and go to Spanish Town Hospital. So she took us, she took me out there. And when I went out there, I was amazed. I didn't know where so many people who knew us. How is it that they got the news to arrive there? There are pastors from all over, friends from all over. People like Sharon and Danny Reed, David Keane. So many people. I did not know how they found out. Um, Sam Vassaro's very good friend. And when I went in, I saw Rod. He was cold. He was pale. He was not he was moving in and out of consciousness and pools of blood underneath the pallet and beside him in the another cubicle is the body of his farm manager and i was i could not believe it and i and i spoke to him <coughs> sorry <coughs> and he responded he, i said roll and i said this is esther and he said yes and he said pray and then he went back into unconscious and then i called sam and sam came in and the two of them you know they're like brothers so sam of course is always crying so sam says roll i love you and and, and, and roll says sam i love you and he gone back again in unconsciousness no the brethren decided that roll needed well our, our friend and and colleague um kelvin ehika metalor Really, Kelvin um, is in the middle of every crisis that we have. Also, this yeah, one here, Alison course, Nicholson, course. every crisis. And yeah, Kelvin yeah. came and Kelvin said, Ron needs to go to UWE. And they said, there's a problem in terms of the transfer. And he sorted it out. Then he said he must go in a helicopter. And they could not get a helicopter. So other brethren connected with the army and whatever, they sorted it out. And the doctor in charge at Spanish Town said, he is going to die. He must go in the ambulance. And there was this argument. If he goes in the ambulance, he is going to die. And so there was this back and forth. But as at the point when they were about to put him in the ambulance, down came this helicopter and they moved him out i couldn't get to him people came from all over the hospital wanted to know if he's a politician there were just so many people then they couldn't get the a cylinder small enough and kelvin said you must use a hundred pound cylinder and the doctor said she's not going and he said you better get in that helicopter so the doctor went and he jumped in an ambulance had prepared the way at ue they heard up there that Dr. Metalor's father is coming. He needs to do surgery. Yeah. And so everything was prepared for him. By the time I arrived there with Carol, of course, driving crazily, I mean, he was in, 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 in the theater being operated on. The, the, the way was just cleared for him, yes. you know? 
Okay, and I just want to remind you of a young doctor who was probably first on the scene with Raul. You want to just Dr. Neil. grace in the middle of fire, grace and yes. mercy. Amen. Dr. Neil, I, I remembered I was reading a, 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 an interview that I had done and I had given the name then. Dr. Neil, when I went in, Dr. Neil was over him and Dr. Neil says, he was praying in tongues and he said, just pray, just pray. You know, and the brethren were outside. They were just praying and interceding for, for all's life because it was touch and go. Well, already the story, you know, just listening to it again is as if this happened yesterday. And we are just so conscious of God's mercy and God's grace. I want to bring in Michaela at this point because she might have been the only one who actually went out there. Yes. Michaela, can you come in and just tell us? We're out there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Michaela? Can you unmute her? She probably needs to be. I unmute. can't. Um, Cargill would have to do that. Stephen, Michaela, try again, please. No? Mickey, are you muted? I don't think. One moment. Should. Okay. <laughs> Michaela says she's here at the ready. <laughs> <laughs> There we okay. go. Hi, Auntie Allison. Hey, Mickey. How are you doing? I'm good. I just wanted to tell us about your impressions, what your experience rather when you went to Spanish Town Hospital just before your father was airlifted to ICU. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was radical. So I still remember getting the call because I was at home sleeping and I think we had maybe at one of our housekeepers who lived in, I think was there. Somebody woke me up because Rosemary. I'd gone to bed late, right? Rosemary was there. So I'd gone to bed late because we were practicing for the play, which Auntie Allison had written and was directing, The King of Hearts. And then got this early morning wake up and went on the phone. And when I went on the phone, it was people from the farm screaming into the phone, like, Mr. T, Mr. T, get shot. And I'm like, what? I'm 15, you know? So I'm like, what is happening? So in any case, shortly after that, Someone transported me to Spanish and I remember grandpa was there. So daddy's father who lived in Mona and we were there just watching the helicopter. And of course they transport you on the little gurney thing. And even as they're transporting you with white sheet on top of you, it's getting so quick blood. It's very dramatic, very loud. As mommy said, a crowd of people were there. I want to say, was Uncle Carl Chambers there maybe? I know definitely JDF folks were there because that oh, was- They had important. migrated the night before Michaela. Oh, really? Oh, yes. well, somebody was there from JDF. Anyway, so it was just very dramatic, very scary. And then the next step was to meet him, I think at UWE, right? He was transferred to UWE. So perhaps the next time we saw him, I just remember the smell of the hospital. The hospitals don't smell nice. It's just very clinical, very, smell like rubber and medical tape and whatever. But like mommy was saying, it's weird to see somebody unconscious in the hospital. You know, their mouth is dry. Daddy didn't look like himself, just lying there. And as a child or a teenager, you're wondering like, what's going on? I remember a lot of people were calling the house. So what we started doing was getting a notebook to write down all the different things. And I recall we had people calling, a lot of people from overseas were calling, which was odd because... Similar to what mommy is saying, you didn't realize so many people would even be aware, you know. And then one time somebody was calling and I don't remember what they said, but for some reason I started sobbing on the phone. There were always brethren in and out of the house at that point, just cycling through pretty much 24 seven because we were kids. And so somebody said, what happened? What happened? You got news? And I was like, no, it's just awful. I was just crying and crying. But it was very tumultuous because we didn't know. And they had said, the person on the phone at the farm said he got shot in his chest. So, you know, as a 15 year old, you're like, oh, that must be death. Like there's no other, you know, thing. There's no other result. Oh. So I think by that point we heard it was a lung and a spinal cord shot. I think at some point early on, we understood it was those two shots. I understood also one of the bullets nearly missed the aorta, like very close to the aorta, but missed it. So we saw that as a big act of grace as well. Great. Um, Esther, yeah. after all went to the hospital, um, Dr. Ramphal came out to you after surgery. Yes, yeah. And you I just want to say though, before that, that um, Sarah, she was 10. 
And Rosemary, when I came home, told me when she told Sarah, Sarah said, That's okay. My dad is a Christian. If he dies, he will go to heaven. <laughs> and Wonderful. she's always been like that. Sarah, you know? when you come in, you can tell us about that. The deep abiding faith. <laughs> yes. Are you coming in, sir? Oh, you wanted me to talk about that now? Yes. Yes, yes. Just take this oh, opportunity. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know where that came from. You know? <laughs> I was just, I just remember, all, as Michaela said, a lot of people coming in and out. I remember Auntie Paulette Gale, she used to wear a prayer shawl. And she would just walk the house, pray, pray with her prayer shawl, walk and pray the whole Oh, no. Whole day. Mm -hmm. I was like, wow, they, got... they said that when they told me that that was my response. And I, I guess, mm -hmm. yeah, I was more thinking that, uh, yeah, you know, he's going to go to heaven. Isn't that what we're all striving for? You know, isn't that our happy place? Um, but uh, nobody wants to hear about the suffering. But say if he says that he died. Um, yeah, I guess I can say that I still have that perspective mm -hmm. today with certain things that uh, mm -hmm. even me and one of my friends were fighting and I was saying, I would never want to take somebody else's life. If somebody came to kill me, I would allow them and not fight back because at least I know where I'm going. They might need another day or two to give their life to the Lord. So my friend said, I'm totally whack. I said, hey, I'm the one with a dad who got shot and my dad forgave the people who shot him. So, yes. you know, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's great though, Sarah. That's great. That's great. But Jonathan was the angriest of the children, Alison. Yeah. Okay. Jonathan was so angry. He wanted to find the gunmen and to shoot them up. And he was so angry. I had to ask Sam Vassal, who's his son, David, and Jonathan, the same age, they were friends, just to draw alongside Jonathan. I don't know, Jonathan, do you want to come in? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm here. Okay. I was told that I was very angry. <clears throat> <laughs> you have no recollection john i i, I mean I, I only not not recollection of that immediate reaction okay I, mean, I do remember being distressed obviously mm -hmm. and um <clears throat> luckily i had a a pretty decent big sister michaela i remember gave me some some comforting words in the midst of it but i mean there definitely was a sense in the in the years to follow, um, you know, like really a sort of, um, I would say, desire to see criminals, um, you know, face maxim the maximum penalty, um, you know, so there would be that sort of mindset um, that I would, ha would have had as a result of, you know, that anger that I, I probably don't remember much of it, but definitely there would have been a more, um, Yes, a, a, a more brutal uh, mindset as regards what criminals deserve. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, it did help that eventually mm -hmm. my father would have you know forgiven these persons. So I think that that kind of helped to get rid of that type of um, anger that would have been there. I was going to leave this for later, but I think I'll jump in right now. Um, Pastor all, I don't know if you remember, but your children all remember you're sending for them. Once you had left the ICU and you were sent down to the wards, you asked for them to come and see you. Esther, correct me if I'm getting it wrong. You're but right. And then they came to see you. I don't know, guys, if you remember that. But when they came to see you, you told them that they must forgive the gunman. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> yes. Anybody? Yes, he's saying yes. Yeah, they, no, no, I'm wondering if the children remember that you were around the bed and he either led you in a prayer or encouraged you to pray and to forgive the gunman. Gunman, gunman. I think so. I mean, oh, it was no, so you don't have that recollection. I will there. say, it's, it's I will in the records. There was definitely a sentiment. Of, yes, it was not an if and or but around yes. our approach to <laughs> the people who were trying to do harm. And I would say that it's left an indelible impact because, you know, even for me personally, after that, like I felt myself drawn to work that always involves how can you have some kind of like restitution or some kind of reconciliation 
when people perpetuate harm, even violent harm. Um, and so I guess maybe it made that kind of lasting impact from that moment, because I, I mean, certainly he would have been in right to say them for dead. <laughs> but, you know, as a result, getting involved with things like Human Rights Council and even the work I do now definitely came from that sentiment. There's no use violence just to get more violence. So, I mean, I think that is the, the life and work of Jesus is to be forgiving. Mm-hmm. And if you can't wrap your head around that, then I don't know if you can fully grasp the gospel message. Yeah. Right. Amen. Yeah. Yes, so um, take us then to when, after all, surgery and you were yet to face um, bad news from Dr. Ramphal after he came through and he graphically right. told you what was happening. Yes. Tell us about that. Yes. So we were there waiting at the hospital while the surgery was done. I remember Kelvin um came out and told us that um the roll had been shot in his spine and then at the end of the surgery dr ramphal who had, was the surgeon came and he called me so i told carol my sister to come with me and he sat me down and he said to me mrs tyson your husband will never walk again he said the bullet went through not only the spinal column but it cut the spinal cord. So there is no way that it will reconnect. He says when there is an accident and the spinal column is damaged, sometimes there is hope that something will happen. But in this instance, the trauma surrounding the bullet, the fact that the spinal column was cut, he said to me, he will never walk again. And I sat there and I said nothing and I did not cry. And he said, you can cry. But looking at myself and what I've gone through over the years, I think I went into a coping mode. I just realized that I had to manage because Raul could no longer manage. I had to manage and I had my children um, to deal with. And so, yeah, that was what happened, you know, and then he was put into ICU. And the brethren, let me tell you, they were there every night outside praying, interceding. They came to our home. They, they, they tumbled over, over each other to find out how they could help. Who would cut the yard? Who would look after the children? Who would sit with Raul at the hospital when I couldn't be there? And I want to say that my community is my support. The grace of God is with me, but part of that mm-hmm. grace is the community that we are a part of. I remember Royal had Royal. Um, well, Esther, I don't know if you can remind us or share with us encounters that Royal may have had a dream or an impression that kind of helped him to go on. Yes, um, yes. Royal told us afterwards that when he was um, feeling that he was losing consciousness, with that when he was shot and he was saying to the Lord, into my that that hands i commit my spirit and then he said he just realized lord i cannot go because i have not finished my work and then he said when he was in icu he was there's a point where all he saw were dead trees just dead trees and then he said after a time some days the images changed to beautiful flowers and trees so we even have a painting in our bedroom with that and he loves that because it reminds him of when he got the the um the images change into life yeah, right. because that represented to him life that he right. would live and as we continue to reflect on grace and mercy in in crisis um can you think of anything esther that might have helped you to face this time anything happening in your own life leading up to that period up to this incident right what 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 was happening to me that was 97 and what the lord was doing was i was waking up very early in the mornings more earlier than no i normally would like at four o'clock it was the spirit of the lord drawing me and i'd wake up i'd spend time in prayer i'd spend time in the word i would, the lord would be giving me different words that i would write down and this went on for months right before this incident happened and I realized afterwards when I look back that the Lord was preparing me spiritually to be able to face this the challenge that we were would with that he knew we would go through because it was no surprise to him okay um 
I believe that during this time, you would have had to be coping with a lot. Um, Roll was in hospital, the children are there, you have to be up and down, up and down. It, you'd probably get tired and drained, um, feeling as if you can't go on. Were there any other coping strategies that God gave you coming out of this time? Coming out of the time with of him being shot? No, just, just generally being in this crisis mode and feeling stressed and drained in order to be able to go on day after day, you know? But well, well, certainly various um, modes. First of all, I can't, I can't manage without spending time with the Lord in terms of prayer right. and right. in the word. And also, I have to say my family, my, my, my sister Carol, she, was, she has always been my defender from, she's younger than I am and she thinks she's older. <laughs> so she was always there with me. My sister Janet, who lives in the state, she flew down to be with me to be, during this time. So I had my family and I had my relationship with the Lord and of course my church family. I have to say that all of those things together helped me to overcome. Amen. You know, and more than anything later on in life, that Raw's own spirit and the way that he handled his situation helped me to be able to deal with it. Good, good. Yes. Not hearing you, Ali. Yeah, you yeah, sorry about that. No, yeah, sorry about that. Um, yes, I'm saying Pastor Roll is behind you saying good. Um, I know that you, you, the Lord also, I think you shared with me that the Lord gave you a strategy for life, as it were, where when you get too stressed mm -hmm. and too overwhelmed, then you know it's time yes. to tell us to 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 withdraw i go off by myself and i spend time to quiet myself to quiet my spirit and to talk to the lord just be quiet and i've realized that in my life that's very important for me to be able to cope Amen. i need to recognize those times and make use of that and my family is used to it by now that they know that i want to take her for a weekend and just be by myself and that's very important to me and there was one time when i was really overwhelmed i don't remember if it's after the second drama or the first and i went to a counselor and he put me through some assessment and when he assessed me my situation he says you must withdraw and spend time alone and it was no surprise to me because i know that was how i have to cope that's how i cope Amen. Somebody wants to know, Esther, if you were working at the time. I'll just slip this question in, even though we're still in the middle of the interview. Were you working at the time? I guess when, they're wondering how you yes. cope. Yes, oh, right through. Raw, yeah. When when Raw was shot, I was vice principal at St. Andrew High School. Um, and the, the, the school was very supportive. Mrs. Ripple was principal. Uh, I had to go overseas with Raw for rehabilitation at Jackson Memorial. And the ministry gave me six weeks leave but the school the board gave me another six <clears throat> weeks so i could be there with him at jackson memorial i was working okay but by god's grace you managed to cope eh? amen um no Roll was not finished pastor Roll was not finished at all after he got better i would love to be able to take everybody to clf on the morning that he came back but i think i think we'll have to skip that out and move on okay. um instead i want jonathan to share about um his trip with his father his father went but went on to do his phd okay. and so he went to um columbia theological seminary yeah. and uh, did his phd and jonathan went with him to help him during this time. Jonathan, any reflections you want to share on that time? Um, sure, um, can you hear me properly? Very, yes, clearly. Okay, great. Um, so, yes, I was, um, it was the summer after fifth form, I believe, and I went with my father for a month to help him, you know, get around as he was doing that phase of his PhD. Um, so it was, it, was a, it was a good time. I always mm -hmm. reflect on it, that you know, I, it gave us time to um, have some quality time, even though he was very busy. He was um, in a group with some other um, pastors from Jamaica as well. 
um, coming from um, CGST. And um, it was it was pretty. Jonathan, U Sir? University Theology, uh, that one. Is, oh, is UTC. That UT, yes. Yeah. Oh, UTC. Okay, yes. His master's was CGST, then he went right. to UTC. Correct. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, so it was, it was, it was really something to, to behold because he, um, you can imagine these other um, persons that he's in the class with, they would have, you know, had class in the day and then in the night would be doing assignments. It was a very intense uh, few weeks. But my father being wheelchair bound, you know, there are certain processes you have to go through um, being in a wheelchair when you want to use the bathroom, um, even bathing. It's, you know, it's quite a procedure. We had a bath chair and all sorts of things. So there would be literally hours that he would have to spend doing these things. And then he would be um, up in the night reading um, in preparation for for the next day of class, so he mm -hmm. had it. He had it so much harder than the average person would. But you know, I was really amazed at how you know determined he was in terms of how he he focused on his work. Um, you could tell even in the in the class. I sat in on a few classes. You could tell that he he you know all of them were pretty bright, but he, his level his level of brilliance was just on another level. So that was really something for me to be able to <laughs> see yes. firsthand. And, um, you know, definitely will always, you know, treasure that time with him. Great, great. Um, so while this is happening, Esther, Grace and Mercy, you experienced both of these um, during this time. And then everyone would have thought that was enough trial for a lifetime. Oh, yes. But this, was, this, this was not to be. Yes. So more grace, more mercy. Tell us about that. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Raul had finished his doctorate. Uh, 2004, he graduated in his wheelchair. Um, I wasn't able to go because I was completing my thesis for my master's. At the same time, 2004, Mikaela was graduating from Princeton. And we were all excited. The family, we were going to go together. Tickets were bought. Jonathan, Sarah, Raul and myself were going up. Ra's mother lived in the U.S. and she had made preparation at a hotel mm -hmm. for him that could accommodate him. And we were all very excited um, that we were preparing to go to Makeda's graduation. And then Raul went to speak at Bethune Avenue, Avenue Holiness Christian Church. Uh, and uh, again, because I was in that phase of completing my thesis, I didn't go with him. Um, Jonathan Simpson, Dougie and Sherry's son, and Ryan Cook, um, Major Cook's son, they went with him to that service. So when they came back, my Jonathan came in and says, Mommy, Jonathan said Daddy couldn't talk for five minutes after he finished the service. And I'm like, what? What do you mean can't talk for five minutes? And I said to Raul, Raul, what is it you couldn't talk for five minutes? And he was laughing. I said, no, it was just a few, it was a few seconds. <clears throat> I said, listen to me, now, Raul, not bother with it, because the children have to go finish university, and we have, all the, we have to purchase this house, and all of this, okay? So I called Alison, my good friend, who always run when I called her, and she came down to see him. I said, I told her what happened. And so Alison came to check him to see what was happening. So she could tell you that part better than I uh, can. But the long and short is that we went to bed because Alison said it was a TIA. And I woke up four o'clock the morning and I called Raul and he didn't respond. I called him again, he didn't respond. I turned on the light. Mm -hmm. And he pulled himself up because he has a rail beside him to move, help him to, to move. And then he had this very puzzled look on his face and behold, his face was twisted. Let me tell you something. I could not believe it. I said, God, Raul has had a stroke. And I called Alison again. Alison said, get him to the hospital immediately. And he would not even allow Jonathan to come in to help to dress him. And brethren is the first I understood what dead weight felt like. He couldn't help himself. And he, I was so, I, when I was finished, I'm telling you, it took me about half an hour to dress him. 
and I was wet. Brawl had had a stroke. The men came and lifted him into the vehicle and took him to the hospital. It was that time that, talking about if I bawled when he was shot, this time I felt like my belly button was going to drop out. I was in a state, I'm sure Sarah would tell you, because she was calm as ever and got on the phone and started to call family and was in control of things. I was not in control. I got myself together and went up to the hospital and Kelvin again. Kelvin trying to find the medication. There's a medication they said that could undo the clot and all of this type of thing. And they tried because it was a four hour window. No, they couldn't find the medication until the next day. Rawl had a stroke. And when they asked the, the, the next day, the neurologist and the speech pathologist came and they assessed him. And I was alone at Tony Twits in that foyer. And that speech pathologist came to me. And she said, Mrs. Tyson, your husband has had the stroke of an 80 year old. He has broke as aphasia. She says he will never speak again. 90% of his understanding has been destroyed. His peripheral vision has been destroyed. And in addition, Rawl had half of his body working. Well, a half of the half did stop work because he could not lift his hand. He couldn't swallow. He, he couldn't talk. And I am like, God, what is this? How am I to cope? How am I to live? Rod is like a, a vegetable. I said, Lord, take him home. Take him home. What is the point? And I was distraught. And I called Karen Gordon. You'll always hear me talk <coughs> about Karen in Rod's life. Because she's the therapist who worked with him when, after he, had, uh, he was shot to help him to manage his body. And Karen said to him when I told her, she says, Esther, whose report are you yeah, going to believe? Good, Rawl good. will talk again. Nice. And brethren, Rawl can't, will not talk publicly, but we can talk. Good. And persons even go to him. Nice. He has his strategies that he has his way of getting people to tell him what's happening yeah. in their lives. And he has his way of communicating with them. Right. So God is a good God in spite of everything. God is a good God. Good. Good. I wonder if any of the children would want to come in now and say anything. Um, Sarah, can you explain where you got that strength and courage from? I wish I knew. I just have to say, okay, the Lord gave me that personality um, to be not very emotional in crisis. <laughs> so just uh, focus on it. It was shocking that, like, really, after all of that, uh, that I get a stroke on top of it, like, really? Um, but, uh, yeah, because everybody was away and, you know, a lot of family members are away and I know that I don't want them to hear, by the way, from somebody else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I was just focused on getting the word out as soon as possible. Yeah. Um, perhaps in the question and answer section, we might have questions on that, just to say that a transient ischemic attack. Um, with that, um, by the way, with Rawls, with Rawls' description kind of varied from the two young fellows' description, but of course they would have been looking on when he was not even aware of what was happening. So their description would have probably been more accurate. Um, okay, so the clot was there um, and then it was released. So his, he, he regained function everywhere. And with something like that, you tend to watch them for a while. Although that was then, that was back in 2000. And how much was that, Esther, 2004? Yeah. Of course, you have more sophisticated investigations that you can do now. At the time, we didn't have any of those. Yeah. But you do have more sophistication investigations now and more dramatic interventions. But again, it depends on the type of stroke, whether it's a clutter, whether it's a hemorrhagic stroke. Um, whether you're bleeding, that is, and the, the, the approach will differ depending on what it is. Um, I remember being near to the bed when the neurologist came in. Um, was it the neurologist who spoke to you, Esther, and gave you the pronouncement? The, the, the speech Do you pathology. Remember? The speech pathology. Right. She had been with him doing their right. study. But just to say that Rawl has defied the outcome that the neurologist, and that is a senior neurologist. Yes, Rawl. Uh, 
electricity <laughs> um, gave then. Um, he defied, he has defied and continues to defy some of the predictions that were made. Um, Esther, in terms of grace and grace again and mercy, um, I think perhaps you can share about the, some of the escapes that you've been able to have, you know, in terms of um, friends, generosity. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, certainly what I want to share is that the fact that Rawl going through the outcomes of the stroke was more devastating for me than when Rawl was shot because I had this dream. I told you how we got married and there's just this sense that, you know, we were going to extend the kingdom of God. Yeah. The children would grow up, we had them young. And therefore, you know, um, even the wheelchair, I would go ahead of Raul to churches where it would speak just to make sure everything was in place. I would sing and he would speak. So that worked. When his stroke happened, when his communication was taken away, I was totally devastated. The dream could no longer be fulfilled in my mind. And I could not understand how God could do that. How could you? Because we were two young people who were all sold out for the Lord. And, you know, this is a good thing. So how come the Lord is going to destroy, allow that dream to be destroyed? It was very difficult for me. And I put myself on seven days of prayer and fasting and my sister Janet says, I will do this with you. And out of that time, the Lord, there are some verses that are very precious to me, very precious. And the, the one is in 2 Corinthians 4, 2 Corinthians 4, uh, 7 to 11. And it talks about that we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the excellency is of God and not of us. That even though we are hard pressed, we're not crushed. Even though that we are perplexed, we don't fall into despair. And it goes on. And that said to me that the power of God in me will enable me to overcome and stand. And then it goes down later in that chapter and it talks about that these trials and sufferings that we go through are momentary. It says, compared to the glory that is going to be revealed in us. And brethren, I hold on to that because I am seeing that glory. I am going to be a part of a glory. And when Paul says it's momentary, understand that this life is momentary. Yeah, look at all the things happening around us. Look at all the things that so many took for granted that's just passing away. It's momentary. But what we hold on to is those things that cannot be shaken. And so I look to eternity. And so for me, I keep that in my mind. I keep those scriptures in my mind. And I said to myself, I said, I am going to hear well done. So if the Lord has ordained for me to walk this way, he has the grace. His grace is sufficient. He has the grace for us to go through it. And I remember asking Raul once when I was so overwhelmed and distressed. I remember one time I really was just so down. And Jonathan and Sarah came and they prayed for me. I was so down. And I realized that there was one a time that Kelvin spoke at church. And he spoke about the altars that we have, for, you know, to the Lord. And he said one of, I don't remember all of the altars, there were five. And he said one of the altars is the altar of death. And I am like, so I, my ears perked up, what is that? And he said, sometimes you have your dreams. And God requires you to lay those dreams down and die. Cause those dreams to die. So you have his dreams. And I am like, but that was, that, that, that was a very you know, spiritual dream that I had. But that word pierced me. And that word allowed me to be able to lay it down. Mm -hmm. And to know that God in his wisdom will find ways for us to help to extend his kingdom. And so that was very important for me, finding those words, understanding, getting what I call an eternal perspective. And even one time I said to Raul, when I was distraught, I think I started saying that and left it. And I said, Raul, how do you cope? And he gave me one word. He could hardly talk at that time. He said, eternity. 
that one word and I've never forgotten to do it because eternity is our reality this is transient this is momentary this is passing eternity when i will receive and i will be that glory that song that says i can only imagine i can only imagine i think i will just fall down like i'm dead before jesus facing that glory although i've been a new body and brethren that is real to me my friends and my children can always tell them, say, I'm longing to go home to be with Jesus. I don't want anybody to put me on a life support system because when the Lord is ready for me, I am ready to go. You hear that, Jonathan, Mikhail, and Sarah? <laughs> I am ready to go. Yes. And so, Alison, that confidence, mm. that confidence that I have that his grace is sufficient the confidence that i have that all of what we go through is momentary and cannot be compared to the glory that will be revealed is what i hold on to and that is my hope and that is my strength and i know that that is my dear husband's hope and strength too we know the god in whom we believe Amen. and we trust Amen. his promises good Thank you so much, Esther. And to our listeners, I would say that is grace and mercy in times of crisis. Pastor Raul, can I give you the last word? Yeah. Just say something to your listeners. Say God is good or hello or something. I think they would, they, they would they'll probably be a little upset with me. No, I won't put you under pressure. This is your story. He can but... do that. He can. Yeah. Okay. God is good. <laughs> All the time. All the time. <laughs> All the time. And I just want to close listeners with Pastor Rawls' first message after he came out of the hospital and before the stroke. He preached. His first message after he was discharged from hospital was on God, God was God is absolutely good, Amen. holding on to bedrock truths. And he then went on to share five indisputable truths: God's goodness, God's faithfulness, God's omnipresence, God's uh, um, can, I remember, can I make out this other one here now, Esther? And God's wisdom. God's sovereignty. I'm sorry. God's sovereignty and God's wisdom. Can I read my own writing? So that's God's goodness, God's faithfulness, God's omnipresence, God's sovereignty, and God's wisdom. And under God's wisdom, he said, God knows best. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. So we come to the end of this. Thank you so much, Tyson family. Really appreciate your making yourselves available. And again, we say God is faithful. And God provides grace and mercy in times of crisis. And this is a wonderful example of how God does that. Real life people giving real life up to the minute testimony. May God continue to bless and keep you Tysons. And may he continue to complete all of his purposes in you. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks. I'm going to hand over now to the host. Cargel, over to you. Wow. Guys, honestly, if I wasn't hosting, I could just be free to just be sitting here bawling uncontrollably. But, you know, I have to be a little professional and keep it together. Oh, my gosh. What an amazing story. Wow. Dr. Nicholson, you were the perfect person to help to pull this story out because you were there as well. You were a part of just the miracle that has been happening for this family. And boy, Mr. and Mrs. Tyson, you guys have a story and what a piece of handsome family Uno have. <laughs> She's um, no man, your family is just awesome, awesome. And we are so happy that everyone was able to come and share with us today. So I'm going to I, I just want to say that they're all committed Christians. Yeah, that is what is good, most good, important good. for us, nice. that our children yeah, are nice. serving the Lord. Uh, Mikhail and her, and her husband are leaders in their church. Her husband is an elder. Sarah, husband, is a pastor. Sarah helps to lead their church. And Jonathan is a committed Christian with his family in Canada. So we give God thanks for them. Amen, amen, amen. All right, so we are going to move into some announcements. Um, we have our, I don't want to call Stephen McCarthy or a technical guy, but he is 
everything, head cook and bottle washer. And so I'm going to ask him to come to the fore now and we will do some brief announcements so people can be aware of our upcoming webinars and just what's happening with Choose Life overall. And then if there are any questions, Dr. Nicholson, perhaps we can deal with those okay. from the audience. So audience members in the interim, if you have any questions that you want to pose to the Tyson family, feel free to go ahead and do so. All right, Stephen, over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good evening. This is Stephen McCarthy here. And my official title is Mixed Media Specialist with Choose Life International. Yes, we've been having a lovely session this evening. What a wonderful message of grace and mercy in over a long period of crisis. And God has been good. God has been with them. Let's do some announcements. Ladies and gentlemen, before I start a message tonight. <laughs> yes, so once again, Choose Life International welcomes you. Welcome to all our first timers, specifically if it is your first time in the forum, if it's your first time being with us, we welcome you. If you're on the live stream, if you're listening on the radio, anything, welcome, extra special welcome to you. Thank you for coming out to the Choose Life International weekly webinar series, completely free to you on Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube. So thank you for coming out. And for all our longtime attendees, praise the Lord for you. We are glad to have you here week after week showing support, and we hope to enrich in your lives with these webinars. If you want to be informed about these webinars in advance, you can follow us on our social media, and say on our Instagram at Choose Life INTL on Facebook and YouTube at um, Choose Life International for both. Just sign up, subscribe, follow all the other buzzwords. Just jump right on and keep informed. Last week we had Choose Life International webinar number one ninety seven, Family Matters, a Father's Day. Sorry. <laughs> I hope I pronounced that correctly. Yes, we had a wonderful day with three families just honoring fathers and talking about their experiences and how does the father really fit into the family and what do they do? Very informative. You can find it on our YouTube to watch. You can find it on our website, Choose Life International. Just watch the recording and you can catch up with us for a live show. This week, you have been watching, in case you joined late and didn't know, you have been watching webinar 198, Family Matters, Grace and Mercy in Family Crisis. And as I said earlier, a very excellent webinar. If you caught it late, don't, don't let the early parts miss you. You don't want to miss any part of the show. If you had to leave early, well, I hope that you can watch the record. Just go on to our YouTube, www.youtube.com slash Choose Life International. Watch the recording and catch up. Choose Life International wishes to invite you to watch our TV show, Geared to Live on Mercy and Truth TV. You can also watch it live using your internet connection on mercyandtruth.tv. Very easy to remember. So if you want to watch it on television, it's Digicel Channel 19 for Jamaicans and on Flow, that's Channel 671 and 601. The Gear to Live TV show is every Thursday, airs every Thursday at 6.30 p.m. and repeats on Saturdays at 6 p.m. Come and hear Dr. Thomas and Mrs. Thomas speak about different issues, just like these webinars, but for television, so don't miss it. CLI prayer time. We invite you to pray with us. Pray for the nation. Pray for our people. Pray for the churches. Submit any prayers that you have as well for our prayer session. Oh, the spelling here. July 20th, 2022. It's every third Wednesday at 7.30 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. And it's the same meeting ID here. 516-152-2200, passcode, choose life. 
That's 516-152-2200, passcode Choose Life. Please join us and pray with us. Consider giving a gift to Choose Life International if you wish to support the ministry with cash or kind, you can speak to us. You can contact us directly. Contact Dr. Donovan Thomas, 876-869-3403. If you wish to donate your time or your funds to Choose Life International to support the business, to support the ministry. You can also check up on our information on our website, www.choselifeintl.org. Or if you wish to send a donation directly, you can send to our business checking account at NCB Matilda's Corner Branch, account number 371-047-131. And repeating that, 371-047-131. If you have interest in a seminar, seminar or webinar for your organization, your church, anything, you can contact us again at those numbers and also include the office numbers, 876-920-7924 um, or 876-856-2966. Call us if you'd like to schedule a counseling session, if you'd like to find out more about what we do, if you'd like to request a webinar or a seminar for your organization, we can help you. We are ready and waiting for your call. God bless. Joe, over to you. Thank you so much for that, Stephen. All right. I am, I don't know if the chats have gotten a chance to take a look in the chat. Man, everybody is sending you some holy pa, holy pa love, you know. And I wanted to read just two comments. Somebody says, wow. Even now, the reality of God's grace and mercy in this journey of the Tysons brings fresh perspective. Somebody else says, Mrs. Tyson, I am so blessed by your testimony. I am strengthened and more firmly grounded in my truth. God's richest blessings continue to be with the Tyson family. I am drawn to go seek the face of God. Love and blessings. And you know, that is really what we hope to accomplish with these sorts of webinars, where we hear about the goodness of God. It is to encourage people that despite their struggles, and man, this Tyson family has been through some struggles. As Sarah said, you know, after her dad was shot and she was like, really? After the shooting and we pulled through this, then a stroke? <laughs> you know, it's... Uh, man so despite the struggles that we are enduring trust and believe that god is still faithful and he is still a good god who loves each and every one of us so that is the most important takeaway for me dr allison any final words from you um uh, just to thank the tysons for sharing their story and their story isn't finished yet so stay tuned there are other things that the Lord will do through them and through their generations, their children and their children's children for generations to come. When people live like this, I, I kind of believe that they set up a generational heritage. Um, um, Esther herself being you know, recipient of such a heritage and Raul helping to establish this. So I look forward to what they will do as well as what their children and their children's children will do. Raul, I just want to let you know that your brother, Alfred, is also on the forum. Yes. So I just thought I would let you know that. And one, Cargill, just out of um, playing devil's advocate, and just because somebody might be saying Esther is strong now, and so she's saying this, I want to just ask her one last question. Yes, Esther, have you ever thought of leaving Raul? <laughs> Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, somebody asked me that at a couple's uh, thing I did. And, and I felt shocked because the thought just never came to me. Why is <laughs> the, is who I serve. It's, it's who, who I am is not just because of role. Who I am is because of my relationship with God. And it is God Amen. who has given us this path to walk. I have to be faithful to him first. I want to hear well done 
Well done, good and faithful Esther. I live for that. And so I am never going to walk away from a situation that the Lord has put me in. And it is God who has called us to this walk. And his grace is sufficient. Amen. And as we live being heaven bound, we will get strength beyond our natural strength. We will get help that we can't see when we're not in the situation. But when we're in the situation, if we keep our eyes on God, he will provide the strength that we need. Amen. So, Carjel, I just want to thank the Tysons again, not just Esther and Roll, but the family. Just want yes. to thank them again for sharing with us. Bless you, Tysons. Yes, and thank, thank you. <laughs> Before you say goodbye, though, boy, Mrs. Tyson, you are, you're really that Proverbs 31 woman, you know. <laughs> right? <laughs> And boy, I aspire to those levels. Man, you are just simply amazing. And I know it is the strength of the Lord himself that you know yes. gives you the power to go on. And also, Mr. Tyson, man, you are just a walking miracle. Amen. And we just thank you and your children for being so amazing, being so obedient to God, being so faithful to God that you could come on this program and share your faith with us and strengthen us in the process by living your truth. Mm -hmm. So we thank you, thank you, thank you for that. All right. We have a few minutes. So we are going to have a few minutes of up close and close up close and personal but before we get to that i noticed that you have some more family members in the chat who probably want to say something so stephen if you could please unmute alfred i see that his hand is raised you can bring greetings to us alfred okay right. hi guys we can hear you go ahead <laughs> yes, um, it's good. It, um, well, let me make it short, right? Um, Esther and Raul Tyson, their influence has not gone just down, it has gone wide on the, the sibling level, mm -hmm. and it has gone up on the, the parent level. Mm -hmm. And um, I must tell you, over the years, I have been, we have been very, very, very encouraged and very, very impressed. You know, it has motivated me in many ways, mm -hmm. you know, in my own family life, right? I mean, you guys, your your family life has been our example. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I just want to thank you. I know other people want to talk. I don't know if you want to say something, Michelle. I'll just say ditto to what Alfred said. And I saw this on Facebook and we hopped on really quick. And <laughs> so just uh, thank you for being a blessing to us. And, you know, we, we love you. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. All right. So we are going to end our live stream on YouTube and Facebook, but we will be on the Zoom platform for another five minutes or so. And so audience members, you can unmute at that time. And if you want to bring a special word to the Tyson family, then that is your opportunity to do so. So to our viewers on Facebook and YouTube, thank you so much for joining us today. If you want to be a part of Up Close and Personal, um, jump on over to the Zoom platform. Stephen, can you remind me of the coordinates, please? After, after 198 webinars, you think I would know it by heart, right? <laughs> Our meeting ID is 516-152-2200 and the passcode Choose Life. Repeating 516-152-2200. Up on in and join us. Thank you so much. So thank you again to our lovely panel. Thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. Stick around for five minutes or so. And then to our, the rest of our audience members who are not on the Zoom platform, thank you for joining in. This has been a webinar by Choose Life International. And you can join us next week, Sunday, at the same time, same place, because we will be here with another interesting topic for you.
Thank you once again.